Welcome to another lifelong nursing video. This video is part two of the neurology questions. Question 11. Which of the following nursing interventions would be appropriate for a patient with increased intracranial pressure after receiving a basilar skull fracture? A. Feeding the patient via an orogastric tube. B. Administering D5W at 100 milliliters an hour. C. Keeping the patient's head of bed flat or D, maintaining a slightly elevated PaCO2? And the answer is A, feeding the patient via an orogastric tube. Patients who have a basilar skull fracture most often have otorrhea and rhinorrhea, and therefore it's contraindicated to insert a nasogastric tube. All the other answers will increase the patient's intracranial pressure. Question 12. What of the following statements are true? The patient who develops delirium will have an increased risk of mortality. B. Delirium is a permanent condition. C. Most patients with delirium exhibit agitation. D. A patient with dementia cannot develop delirium. The answer is A. The patient who develops delirium will have an increased risk of mortality. Research has shown that delirium develops in a patient has increased risk for worse outcomes. Delirium is an acute and short-term development and therefore not permanent. Most patients with delirium do not experience agitation, and patients who have dementia can develop delirium. Next question. A 47-year-old woman presented to the hospital with complaints of the worst headache I've ever had. She was diagnosed with a grade 1 aneurysm. Which answer describes a grade 1 aneurysm? A. Decerebit posturing and coma. B. Mild to severe hemiparesis and a stuporous patient. C. Minimal neurological deficits with a mild to severe headache. And D. Minimal headache, no neurological deficits. And the answer is D. Minimal headache with no neurological deficits. And this is because when you refer to the Hunt and Hess scale, answer D describes a grade 1 aneurysm and has signs of a subarachnoid hemorrhage secondary to her aneurysm. Answer A is a grade 5, answer B is a grade 4, and leaving C with a grade 2 on the Hunt and Hess scale. 14. Which of the following patients would most likely need neurosurgery? A patient with basilar skull fracture, a patient with bacterial meningitis, a patient with subdural hematoma, or a patient with metabolic encephalopathy? And the answer is C, a patient with a subdural hematoma. This is because the patient with a subdural hematoma requires neurosurgery to remove that hematoma, or in other words, evacuate. The basilar skull fracture is medically managed as well as the meningitis and encephalopathy, and typically do not require surgery. Question 15. Your patient suffered a severe hemorrhagic stroke four days ago. You suspect brain death. Which of the following is consistent with brain death? A. Posturing B. A positive Babinski reflex C. A coma or D. Absent corneal gag and cough reflexes The answer is D. Absent corneal gag and cough reflexes This is because loss in cranial nerves originating from the brainstem, such as those in cough, gag, and corneal, indicate a loss of brainstem activity, which presents in brain death. The other answers do not indicate brain death. Question 16. Which of the following is true in the presence of benign brain tumors? A. Mortality rates remain low. B. Seizures are an early symptom. C. Steroids should not be given with benign brain tumors, but with malignant tumors. Or D. Benign brain tumors do not cause death. And the answer is B. Seizures are an early symptom. Seizures are most often an early symptom in the presence of brain tumors. Mortality rates remain high with brain tumors, whether it's benign or malignant. Steroids may be given to help with the reduction of intracranial pressures with brain tumors, and benign brain tumors do in fact cause death. Question 17. Which of the following should the nurse do to manage a patient with a tonic-clonic seizure with a normal phenytoin, otherwise known as Dilantin, level? A. Turn the patient to the side, administer lorazepam, Ativan. 
B. Monitor the length of the seizure and assess the level of consciousness. C. Monitor the length and duration of the seizure while inserting a bite block. Or D. Turn the patient to the side and administer phenytoin, otherwise known as Dilantin. The answer is A. Turn the patient to the side, administer lorazepam. Administering a first-line benzodiazepine drug, such as lorazepam, is indicated in the setting of a seizure. Turning the patient to the side is beneficial in helping protect the patient's airway. Administering phenytoin is not an immediate priority. The other answers are not a priority. Next, your patient has been diagnosed with Guillain-Barre and is nervous about her condition. When explaining the patient's condition to her, which of the following would the nurse explain correctly about Guillain-Barre? A. Coma is inevitable unless we begin your plasmapheresis. B. Guillain-Barre will cause you to be weak only on one side of your body. C. Your ability to breathe will be monitored very closely. Or D. Your condition was most likely caused by bacterial infection. The answer is C. Your ability to breathe will be monitored very closely. Guillain-Barre begins distally and continues to develop in a bilateral ascending pattern often impeding respiratory failure due to weakness of the diaphragm. Your patient's mental status and level of consciousness will not be affected, and Guillain-Barre is often associated with viral infections, not bacterial. 19. Which of the following answers would most likely prevent a further increase in intracranial pressure, or most likely prevent a decrease in cerebral perfusion? A. Maintaining the patient's neck in a flexed position. B. Keeping the patient's head of bed at a 45 degree angle. C. Maintain the patient's PaCO2 level 25 to 35. D. Using restraints in a combative patient to help keep them still. The answer is B. Maintaining the patient's head of bed at a 45 degree angle. This is because elevating the head of bed will assist in decreasing the ICP by promoting drainage intervascularly. Flexing the patient's neck will increase the intracranial pressure. Keeping the PaCO2 level in an alkalotic state will cause vasoconstriction, therefore reducing cerebral perfusion. Reducing agitation in a combative patient will help decrease intracranial pressure, however, using restraints are contraindicated as the patient may become more agitated. Last question, question 20. A 42-year-old patient who just experienced a right hemispheric stroke from complications from atrial fibrillation which describes the patient's presentation with a right hemispheric stroke. A, eyes that deviate to the right, left-sided weakness, and right pupil dilation. B, eyes that deviate to the right with left-sided weakness and left pupil dilation. C, eyes that deviate to the left, right-sided weakness, and left pupil dilation. Or D, eyes that deviate to the left, right-sided weakness, and right pupil dilation. The answer is A, eyes that deviate to the right, left-sided weakness, and right pupil dilation. The clinical presentation of a stroke demonstrates eyes that look toward the damage with pupil dilation on the same side. Motor and sensory deficits present on the opposite side of the pathology. The other answers are incorrect. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked the video, please subscribe to the channel for more educational content and to learn more about nursing and healthcare. Also, please visit lifelongnursing.com for more helpful information on certifications as well as free certification review videos. I'm Brent. This has been another Lifelong Nursing video. And remember, learn everything. Mm -hmm.